Hi, this is your host, Swapnil Bharti, and welcome to TFR Insights, a show where we deep dive into cloud native security. And today we have with us Radhan Triplani, President and CEO of Tigera. Radhan, first of all, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you, Sapnil. Great to be here. In the, in the cloud native world, if I'm not wrong, cl- uh, security is no longer an afterthought it should not be. We are trying to move it into developers' workflow and pipeline. We are talking about zero trust, shift left. So let's talk about Tigera from this changed landscape. So uh, since this is the first time we're talking, can you tell me a bit about Tigera from this new uh, changed landscape of security in the cloud native world? So first, uh, you know, we, we are an open source company, Project Calico. We power over a million Kubernetes nodes across 166 countries. All the public clouds have picked us for their own managed Kubernetes service for security and observability. And our philosophy is that just like Kubernetes uses a declarative model, which is what makes it so powerful, we need something analogous to that for both security and observability. Uh, You need security and observability as core. So that's our underlying philosophy. And that's the solution we've implemented in a cloud native way, in a cube native way. And that's what we provided to large enterprises and there are tens of thousands of people out there using Calico. Let's talk about uh, the change landscape because of immutable workloads, uh, environments, and also in the cloud native world when we talk about DevOps, DevSecOps. What does it mean for security uh, in early days? Security was an afterthought. It was someone else's problem. Number number two was do not fix it if it's not broken. In the cloud native world, you are breaking things. You are like pushing so many updates. CI, CD, uh, CD is a critical piece of how you're pushing things. So talk about how this the way things have changed, the way we are building the infrastructure, we are deploying application. And then you're also talking about edge where you are running on millions of you know uh, centers. So talk about how security has changed there. First, I'd say the many dimensions you touched upon. The first one is these uh, workloads, containers, microservices are highly dynamic and elastic with scale out. So the notion of, produ- uh, of providing security on the perimeter through static predefined rules based on static IP addresses. That's archaic, it's not effective, it doesn't work. So that creates an enormous amount of friction where these workloads are being deployed dynamically. So that's the first challenge we see. The second is the power has clearly shifted, the dynamic has shifted to the developers trying to control and manage. And that's certainly where the center of gravity is. So you have to be able to bring in the developers into the equation of security and empower them and give them the tools they need to actually embrace security and formulate some of the security that they need and the observability they need. Treat that as code. And the third part is, you know, we've always thought about security and observability as separate and discrete things from code. And in this world, it really doesn't work. So our philosophy and view is that security and observability have to get wired in into your application so that they move with the application. So that then gives you the flexibility. Maybe you're running your application on-prem or in AWS or Azure, but what if the security moved with your application? So that's our philosophy and that's what we provide through our solution. Can you talk about the relationship between observability and security? Because if you're not, you don't have a very clear you know, view of your environment or system, you cannot secure it. Also, I would also like to talk about uh, something that we call a street lamp effect. When we do talk about observability, if you are only seeing what you can see, there are a lot of things that are beyond. So, so, so can you talk about this aspect? There's definitely a symbiotic view and relationship between security and observability, one which you already stated. Uh, you actually have to be able to see what's going on to ensure that you can secure it. So that's the most uh, simply stated thing. So that, that, that's the beginning. And the the manifestation in this world of distributed environment where everything is dynamic is a lot more complex because it is difficult, if not impossible, to map out every permutation and combination of what can talk to what. And especially when you have advanced persistent threats, if there's some some of the deviant behavior, to be able to spot that is non-trivial. 
And uh, unfortunately, most of this you can only observe at runtime, right? You cannot observe this or predefine this at build time. So being able to understand the runtime behavior of this is incredibly important. The second, second point is, uh, which is a little bit counterintuitive, if you actually do a terrific job in applying some of the modern security controls uh, to these cloud-native workloads, you may have inadvertently created a, created a problem for the developers because when something is not working, it could very well be that there is some security control that's preventing it from working. So these two things have to go together. Security and observability have to go together. And the last thing I'll say is at the heart of both security and observability is really the data, the runtime data that, and, and the security and observability are really manifestations of the value of being able to understand runtime data at a very fine grain, granular level. And, and really that's what we provide. When we look at security, uh, there are so many factors that can lead to, to uh, problems. One is, of course, bugs are there, and there is nothing you can do about bugs. Uh, as long as you're writing software, there will be bugs. It's a pro part of the software development process. So we cannot even say, hey, you know, let's get rid of bugs. Second is uh, human errors or misconfiguration. So that becomes you know, a challenge which can be so uh, from your perspective, which are the factors that you consider to be real security risk? And of course, Project Calico is there. A lot of other projects are there. If you look at CNCF landscape, it's becoming very, very busy space. So, so talk about the factors and then how are you working on mitigating some of these uh, security issues? So I'd say, you know, when you, when you deploy something in Kubernetes at a very simplistic level, there are, there are three sources of challenges uh, beyond the obvious ones. You know, you can always do some scanning for known vulnerabilities and you should, that's a good practice. Uh, I'd like to be able to tell you that's necessary, but most attackers don't follow the rules. They know what the known vulnerabilities are so the odds are pretty high. They're coming at you from a different angle, right? So the first thing is for a Kubernetes cluster, you have to be able to establish north-south controls, right? At a very fine-grained level. In, in plain English, the traffic coming into the cluster trying to access your services, which of it do you let in? And which traffic do you allow it to access to which particular microservice inside your Kubernetes cluster? is a decision you have to make and sounds trivial, but just given the dynamic nature and also the number of microservices running inside a cluster, uh, that could very, very quickly become an enormous challenge. Uh, related to that, the south part is any service sitting on your cluster has to be able to access some external resource. Maybe it's trying to talk to a SaaS application like a Salesforce outside in a, in a different cloud. Maybe it's trying to talk to an API like a Twilio outside, outside the Kubernetes cluster. Or maybe it's trying to access an RDS inside AWS, right, outside the Kubernetes cluster. So you've got to be able to make runtime decisions about which service is allowed to talk to which other external service. Uh, or API or application, and that's a non-trivial thing. So that's the South. So you first have to establish North-South controls at a very fine-grained level, at the application level, and at, down to the L3 level. Uh, the second big challenge really is around within the cluster itself. Uh, what we have noticed is the best and most sophisticated companies on the planet they operate with a simple assumption that they, they're already compromised inside the cluster. So they have the philosophy of building in defense and depth where they can limit the blast radius once something is already compromised. And the way to do that would be to establish very fine-grained east-west controls within a cluster at the host level, at the application level, and, and, and also at the container level. So all three levels, if we establish that, even if you have an APT, you can control any kind of data exfiltration that's happening. <clears throat> so that's the east-west controls. The third part is to actually establish additional controls uh, to, again, with the philosophy of it's only a matter of time before something gets compromised. 
So one simple best practice is just to encrypt all data in motion. So that, that gives you a little bit of a safety net. Uh, but more importantly, to have, uh, and what we have built is a Kubernetes-specific IPS and IDS, intrusion prevention and intrusion detection system, to actually look at the flow of data inside the cluster and detect any kind of anomalies of that, and to dynamically not only detect it, but to be able to quarantine that in real time is an incredibly important control you can place. So those are three buckets, the north-south controls, east-west controls, and an additional level of security controls through IPS, IDS, and encryption. If you do this, you're probably implementing security comparable to what some of the largest financial institutions on the planet are implementing, and you, you're going to have an incredibly secure Kubernetes infrastructure. Right. Uh, this may be uh, outside of this uh, discussion, but since we are talking about uh, some large corporations and they, at times, they have their own clouds. When we do talk about security, we uh, kind of focus only in the Kubernetes world. We, when we do say serverless, there is a server. Kubernetes also runs on top of Linux. So uh, <laughs> what about uh, so when we talk about cloud native workload, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There is a big giant iceberg, which is your actual infrastructure, where you know you're talking about low-level kernel stuff. And you know, just the way uh, I think two weeks ago we heard about that bug for the sudoers, you know, where. So uh, if if I ask you that, what kind of approach people should have when they look at security? Should they have a, this myopic view to just look at their cloud workload, or they should have a holistic view where they should also look at every piece that is touching their code? No, that's a great point, and, and I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, the truth is, while we'd all like to just live at the application level, there's an entire stack below that. So you could brag about protecting the application, but if the stack below you is compromised, then all bets are off. So the taking an integrated approach at the host level, at the container level, at the application level is incredibly important. And this is what, what best in class companies do. And that's why they're so effective with security. Security is uh, becoming a serious topic. It is becoming also a part of a developer's workflow. What kind of trends are you seeing when you actually deal with customers? Because there is still, we hear and see a lot of reports where uh, uh, as much as we like to see the shift let on uh, zero trust, uh, people, uh, because there are a lot of factors. Number one is that, it delays the release, you know. There are a lot of, you know, also, when are you going to update a system? Weekends can become expensive, weekdays you can afford it. So there are so many things. So what kind of trends you're seeing where people are trying to move along with security, uh, which will uh, kind of uh, also affect the kind of tools, technology that we are building to help them move forward? Yeah, I'd say, you know, probably it's uh, the trend I see is more behavioral in nature, where instead of treating, you probably mentioned this earlier on, instead of treating security as a bolt-on in the end, if you are actually trying to design in security and observability upstream when you're designing the application, I think that's when it's most effective. And the behavioral part is we are seeing best-in-class company involve the, the developers in security as part of the design, as opposed to forcing them or trying to police them to make sure that they do that. But along with that, you need the right tools and the framework. And this is one of the reasons we came up with the philosophy of you got to treat security as code and observability as code. And if you do that, the developers are more likely to embrace it and be part of the solution. So the other uh, other part uh, to, to think about, which is a little bit counterintuitive, is the hackers themselves are actually developers, right? The hackers are very sophisticated developers. And the only way to counter them is not through point tools that a single team in security is deploying, but to recruit some of your own developers to help counter these hackers who are trying to find every different way to break into your system. Uh, and they're using very sophisticated programming techniques. So, so honestly, that's what we are seeing the more sophisticated companies do. And uh, our hope and our vision is that, you know, security really will be a business enabler and it should be 
What is mi what it's missing today is the right framework, and that's why you have to start to treat security and observability as code. Pratan, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about Caliber Cloud and the importance of observability and how you are bringing that aspect also, because as you also alluded earlier that without observability, <laughs> security uh, doesn't uh, make much sense. So first of all, thank you for your time today, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Sato. Enjoy the conversation.